to uh, New Seasons of Leaders Connect. And uh, this is actually my contributions. The uh, 25th. And I'm going to say a name, and if, you don't, if you're listening and not talking, you could have seen you're the recipient of $1 million. The name is Fred. Anybody else? <laughs> Fred was talking to Steve, so we missed one more month of giving away a million dollars. So next month, when I start talking, stop talking and you can be... So when I grew up, I always wanted to be that guy that gave away the million. Now, I'm going to take a poll. All right, you got to choose between two things here. Uh, first of all, how many of you don't know what I'm talking about when I talked about the guy that gave away money? How many of you never saw the millionaire? Come on in, folks. Okay, now we got one. You're in the Hold on. That's what a million dollars meant. Yes, that's what a million dollars meant. That's how many people got started. But anyway, The Millionaire was this show that ran probably in the 50s and 60s, and this guy's job was to give away a million dollars every every every. Week. I saw it. Yeah. You saw it? I see you looking at me, but I saw it. No, you're, not, you're too young for that. Thank you, but yeah, no. Right. <laughs> you just look. All right, so you have your choice. Would you rather have been the person who gave the million dollars <laughs> or the person who got the million dollars? Okay, so you got a choice. You got to choose here. Think deeply. All right, for those who would rather be the one who gave the money, raise your hand. Look around. Okay. Keep it up. Keep it up. You can't split the difference here. <laughs> All right. Now, how would you rather be the person that got the million dollars? You know, it's pretty darn close here. So, this is uh, very, this is my uh, this is my lead into what this what this program is about. Uh, it's about uh, to use a, a phrase my friend uh, Wayne Baker uses. It's about giving and getting. Okay, so as members of the Leaders Connect audience, and now you're official members, you're supposed to be giving away things, okay? Uh, if you have a million dollars, hold on to it. If you have a hundred million dollars, give us, give about, uh, you know, at least, what, 95 of them, by the way. Who knew it needs more than two or three million? That's plenty. So, um, so do that, and uh, I work with many presidents, none of whom have followed, maybe Mr. Obama has followed that, yet, but not too many. But anyway, giveaway give is actually a better way to uh, connect with people than to get from people. And it's, the research seems to show that, that you actually get more out of giving um, and then getting. Uh, but if you are in the issue, in the uh, world of networking and wanting to make connections and want to be successful and want to be happy, it's also good to get. So if you just think about that today, have you done anything for somebody else? You know, have you given away, it just could be a smile. Uh, yesterday I, I had a great chat with a bartender at an event I went to and uh, nobody was talking to the bartender and I started talking to this guy and uh, this is in Detroit. I had no idea what his, his name was Dushan. I never saw that name, that was kind of fringe. It turns out that when I told him I was teaching at the University of Michigan, he said, oh, my son is going there next year. And his son isn't gonna start in the School of Engineering and he's this amazing kid, he's African-American from Detroit and he can go to any place he wants and he chose the university. So we had a great conversation, you know? And so he gave me something. I gave him some ideas about you know, what he might do to help his son make a good transition to college. He had like a three minute talk. But it was very, very meaningful. And, and you know people who do that, who just go out and talk to whoever. And they don't care whether that person is president of an organization or whether that person is uh, the janitor or the bartender or whatever, but they just like to, to uh, talk. So that's the theme of the group. And we have a, a scheme group here that is going to give today some of uh, their sage advice and experience. Why don't you guys come up and sit up here? And uh, we'll introduce them in a few minutes. If you don't mind, I would like to do a few introductions first. And uh, we, we typically, in the audience, have an opportunity for people to kind of pitch what they've been doing. And uh, uh, Leaders Connect often is about uh, great things that are happening in the communities. And it's about people who are asking for things or people who might be giving things. 
Uh, first of all, in terms of giving, we have, I want to talk about our sponsors. We have several great sponsors. We have Bank of Ann Arbor. It's here for Bank of Ann Arbor, which gives a tremendous amount to the community. How many went to Sonic Lunch this summer? Anybody get to Sonic Lunch? Yeah, here's some great music. Um, this is a guy from Wolfpack, which is pretty cool. And uh, we also have Raymond, and uh, Chris is here from Raymond, and we'll talk about Raymond, and you guys also help people with their financial uh, life and uh, financial well-being. We kind of work together. You work with the mind. I work with the mind. You work with the money, right? That's good. One without the other is no good. It's a, you know, you have to do both. Uh, we also have Roger Rail, uh, and uh, Roger is uh, a very excellent tech uh, I want to thank Roger because he's got the chance here to work with me on this. And talk about giving, he gives so much to the community because he goes out and he tapes videos, a lot of these great programs, including Leaders Connect. And if you search on Leaders Connect or Rob Pasek on YouTube, there's a channel there, and we have about 30. Uh, 30 of these events that are available in full. And they're actually great for training. I mean, if you want to do training at your center, Evan, uh, you know, just show those over lunch and have a conversation just like you have here. And uh, we started counting up. I, I didn't know how to count the views. And Roger told me, well, you actually right on the page you can see. And we got like over a couple thousand views of these over the years. So some of them had 300 views, some had, you know, 70, 80. Uh, I'm sure you guys will probably Pass it off the charts today, you know, so uh, especially if you put your pictures up there. Uh, and so, uh, Roger's one of our sponsors, and today we're going to uh, add a new sponsor, and it's actually a, a sponsor that we're going to give to rather than get from. So, uh, I'm going to let Doug uh, come up and talk about North Star Reach, and we're going to be, we don't charge for this. We do get support from Raymond and Bank of Ann Arbor and Roger, and the other one is Zingerman's, of course. Is anybody here from Zingerman's? No, but Zingerman's is an amazing community support. And they've been helping this program. I've actually worked with uh, Ari for, since he started, so over 35 years. And uh, he's been a great support in the organization that made this happen in this room with the great food and the great coffee. So, um, but Doug, come on up, and Doug is, uh, with North Star Reach, and uh, what I'm asking is that people don't pay for this, but we want you to support a nonprofit. And the one that we're going to support this year, 2018-19, is North Star Reach. And when Doug will tell you why, you'll understand why you might want to take out your checkbook uh, and uh, think about supporting this camp as uh, as the year ends here. Doug, thanks, Rob. As the CEO of a nonprofit, please don't tell my development director I raised my hand about giving away the million dollars. <laughs> but uh, I think that that sums up what camp is. Uh, I'm sorry, got to get back in the camera frame. Uh, we have a, a year-round camp program for children with serious health challenges that opened two summers ago, uh, 2016, in Pinckney on Patterson Lake, and it's completely free of charge. And we take kids out to camp who, for medical reasons, really have limited opportunities to go anywhere else to camp. So we serve kids who've had organ transplant, kids who have congenital heart disease, kids who have sickle cell anemia, uh, kids who have epilepsy. And we have doctors and nurses, and we're fortunate to have EPMG uh, faculty out there helping uh, provide and volunteer their time to give these kids uh, the medical attention they need while we give them a traditional summer camp experience. And we've got canoeing and swimming and archery and arts and crafts and all of the things you think about when you think about summer camp done in an environment that's physically safe. Uh, everything is accommodating for children who have any kind of limitations or challenges. It's medically safe because we've got a great health center and medical volunteers and we can do dialysis, we can do chemotherapy, we can do breathing treatments, we can do whatever these kids need so that they don't have to interrupt their activities, we make it portable, we take it out into camp so that they don't have to uh, come into the health center uh, in the middle of an activity period, the nurses and, and doctors find them where they are. Um, and it really gives these kids an opportunity to feel normal. They've been cheated out of their childhood, they 
missed school, they've missed regular peer interactions. Many of them have never spent the night away from their parents except when they've been in the hospital. And then they come to camp for a week and they find a whole new world of opportunity. And they find that a lot of the barriers and limitations that maybe the medical profession or their parents told them as soon as they were diagnosed, okay, you can't do this, you can't do this. They come to camp and find they can do when they're in this really well-supported environment. We do this all free of charge, and that's in thanks to corporate partners, private partners, fundraising events, volunteerism, and, and getting people to come out to camp. And while we rely on the medical team to come out and staff the health center, the whole rest of the camp is staffed by people who just want to come out and, and spend some real quality time with kids. And we change lives. We change lives of these kids. We change lives of the families. We change lives of all the volunteers that come out and, and interact um, with these kids. And it's, it's really, uh, I've been taking organ transplant kids to camp for more than 20 years. And that sort of led down this path of, hey, let's build a facility. Let's serve more kids. And I call it a guilty pleasure because the more I invest in my time and energy to make sure that these kids have an amazing time, the taller I feel and, and uh, when I walk away from camp. And it's just a self-fulfilling uh, thing. So yeah. thanks so I much. To, I, want to, I want to just mention a couple of things. Doug is, uh, has been working with, with me in a group for many years. And uh, how many, there's several of the people who have been in groups with me. We raise your hand, Steve, Marvin, I know, and Connie. And, uh, these groups kind of focus on helping people with goals, setting goals, and uh, I wanted to tell people, there's a lot of consultants out here, that um, your facility is amazing, and uh, it's beautiful, it's, it's uh, in, in an amazing spot uh, over a lake, and uh, Doug is thinking about raising some money for the camp by using this as a facility to do retreats. So I know a lot of you, how many of you companies do retreats, quite a few of your companies, so, you know, if you're thinking about a great place, Chris, to bring your Raven group, it's uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's near hell, but then besides that, it's <laughs> uh, uh, And you get one of those t-shirts, I've been to hell and back, and, you know, so that's good. But it's, it's really nice, you're gonna put a ropes course out there and different kind of challenge things, so it's not just you go out and use the canoes and all that, which is a lot of fun, uh, or even for winter, it's, it looks like it's good cross-country skiing. So if you're looking for a spot, this is an, another business that the group is trying to help Doug figure out how to promote that. So thank you very much. Thanks. I also love the um, stories of success. I, I, I just started a new channel on uh, Facebook called the Success Connection. And Doug to me is, is an embodiment and it's kind of a, a hero for me because he was a nurse at U of M in the transplant unit, right? And how long ago was it that you had this concept in your mind? Come on up again, if you were talking about here. How long was it? Well, 12, 13 years ago. Okay, so 12, 13 years ago, it was an idea, right? And you took kids to some other camps, but you didn't have your kids. And then over the years, you had to bring them to reality and get in buy-in from who were the different people you had to get buy-in. Well, it started with the University of Michigan. We repurposed some property that they were going to sell, uh, and they leased it to us uh, for 50 years for a dollar a year. Uh, we partnered with health centers all across uh, Michigan and into Chicago. So we've got 12 hospital partners who uh, have memorandums of understanding to send kids and send uh, staff to camp. And then, of course, it was the community. It was getting uh, people to see this vision and make large investments because we build about an $18 million facility out in the woods uh, for these kids to give them all the modern conveniences in a rustic environment. And this is uh, why I say that, I've got to keep over here from Roger, you don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> but uh, the idea that you could conceive of something, dream of something, and then you could make it happen. And uh, you, you can pull together all these different threads that make this tapestry that's the camp and then keep it going. And now it's not over because you got the initial money to build the camp. All the kids come for free, whether they're from uh, very poor families to very rich families, it doesn't matter. They don't make discrimination on that basis. And uh, right, so that's the, the, the challenge you are now. It's probably the least fun you have of all this is, is asking people for money. So uh, for those of you that uh, could give him ideas about where to find support, that would be great. And they can reach at northstarreach.com 
O-R-G. O-R-G, North Star reached out O-R-G. Okay, we'll put it out there, though. Thank Great. you. Great, thanks. Lauren and uh, we're doing a couple other projects that I wanted to talk about um, that, are, that are very exciting. Uh, so Lauren is a, uh, what are you, high school senior? I'm a senior at Saline High School. This year. So could you tell them a little bit about what we got going this summer? Okay, so this summer we... Lauren Humphreys, by the way. Um, I read Robin's book, Self-Aware, and we're transforming it basically into a curriculum for high school juniors and seniors to discover themselves and their passions and then turn that into where they want to go to college, what they want to do, and what they want from a college. Yeah. Right. So it's a lot of fun you're a senior and you don't want to tell them where you want to go to college, do you? <laughs> so here's my test. <laughs> I just moved here a year ago. This is a secret. But she just moved here a year ago from uh, oh, 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 that place down south. Oh, 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 oh. I can't say that. And uh, she's thinking of going to that oh, oh, oh S Google. So uh, we need to you know, hit her hard here with uh, how great it is to go to the University of Michigan. And uh, so we keep you in the state, right? Because yeah, this book will come out. We're going to write a book. And uh, Ali uh, is also working with us. Steve's helping out. And another cool thing in terms of connections, I'm teaching a class at the University of Michigan for college seniors. So we've got four college seniors in my class who have volunteered to work with Lauren and Ali to give them another perspective on this book because they're using it for the class. And then Lauren's going to figure out how we can help this to, uh, and here you are, Ali, right on, right on target. Man. So and, uh, Ali wants to go to Michigan, but you got to tell him that the hour starts on the hour now. It's not the Michigan hour where it starts 10 after. <laughs> on the hour, Ali. <laughs> but you dressed well, you got, you got, got here. So uh, come on over, Ali. I don't mean to give you a hard time, but can you talk a little bit about your experience doing the book and what, what you like about working on this? Yeah, so um, I got involved through this project um, with my mom, uh, Dr. Ossie. She, uh, she knew Patrick from a while ago, yeah. and she uh, reached out to him, and he said that he's working on this project, and he'd like me to get involved. It was about some time last August. Yeah, yeah the middle, beginning of summer. Be, yeah, beginning of some, sometime around then. Um, I was quite interested. I started working on it, and I learned a lot about myself, and I realized that all the stuff that I'm learning about being self-aware and emotionally intelligent applies to myself. And I realized that the book was focusing more on college students. So as we got this idea to work with it for high school students, I figured that I had a lot of things to contribute and a lot of things to learn. So um, just helping other people and then realizing there's a lot of stuff to learn for both me and Lauren, I thought it was really cool. Thank you, and, and we're really excited about it. And uh, by the way, when he came to me, he could hardly speak out loud. He, 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 now look at how articulate he is. He just, just, <laughs> just, 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 right? But let's hear it for Ali and, and Lauren. And our, our ask is uh, from you about this. Uh, if you know people in the schools, we're trying to figure out how to pilot this in, uh, in, in uh, you're in uh, Saline, you're in Ann Arbor, but if you have connections to schools, or if you have a junior or senior that want to get involved in maybe proofing the, the reading and helping uh, think about, does this speak to them? Because it's different speaking to a high school, se high school senior versus a, uh, a college senior. So thank you very much. And Lauren, by the way, is, is Beth's daughter. Beth is my new associate, so Beth Humphreys, and uh, thank you for bringing your great work and also uh, lowering into our lives. Thank you. Uh, Steve, you want to talk about what we've been up to, too? We've got lots of interesting yeah. threads here. So. I'm a senior at Skyline High School. <laughs> Actually, Steve, I knew him about when he was a senior because he started running fit and he was, what, 26 or something like that? Yeah, yeah right. 26. Yep. And he uh, provided uh, my sons, who were teenagers, uh, their first jobs when they were working art fair at about 12, selling shoes. And so he and I have been working together for a long time, knowing each other for a long time. And we cooked up with Beth uh, another project we want to share. Right. This is... Uh so um, I was, a lot of you probably recognize me, tell you, that's the shoe guy, the running guy, because that's <laughs> so always kind of the, uh, very nice oh yeah, yeah, right, I dress for success here, Nike. Uh, always business casual, yeah. uh, but uh, I have uh, 
semi-retired from the, the shoe industry. And what I've been uh, working on lately with uh, Rob and his associate Beth is what's on your chair, that little card, uh, workshop that's coming up. And this is a workshop that we call Finding Your Sweet Spot in Career and Lifestyle. And I, I, I want to get involved with this because over the years, like Rob mentioned, I use that old adage of, uh, how many know the sharpening your saw story? Well, not many, so the sharpening your saw story is one of the, this analogy of the, the woodsman that had a competition who could cut the most wood over a, a given period. And one of the fellows was grinding away, grinding away. Uh, another one, grinding away, cutting wood, but stopped, took breaks. And what he did was he left cutting the wood and he went and cleaned his blade and he uh, sharpened all the teeth in it and went back to work with a, an improved tool. And with that, he ended up cutting more wood. And so uh, definitely over the, the 30 years of, of building the running fit business, which went from one small store to, to a dozen here in Michigan and, and all kinds of wacky and crazy races that we put on, uh, I took breaks to sharpen my saw. And uh, one of the resources I used was Rob. So I was involved in the groups uh, and in workshops. And so now I want to I wanna get involved and share a little bit of that and give some of that back, what I, I've learned through him. So Rob, Beth, and I are putting this workshop together. And what we're really, what it's really targeted for is find, going in and discovering your, your talents, your passions, combining that with the mind, body, and spirit so that you can get the ultimate uh, out of uh, growth and both in your career and what you're doing in life. And I know that, that that's what you're doing right now. You're sharpening your sauce by being here and we're, we're preaching to the choir a little bit. Um, but besides yourself, you know, think about there might be people in your in your family, uh, peers, coworkers that might be interested in that. So that we're real excited about that. There's a little card on on every chair that has the, the date and, and how you can register and find out more about it. Or please, you know, pull me aside after uh, uh, after the presentation today, and I'd be happy to talk to you at Rob. Uh, what's the format? It's a workshop. So it's so it's going to be a workshop, and it's based on. Uh, uh, all the material from, from Rob's book, The Self-Aware. What's the time involved? And the time involved, it's a, uh, it's, it's a Thursday morning, morning, and it's uh, like an 8 to uh, 30 kind of, kind of uh, setup. And it'll be out at, uh, at Rob's office on Lucas Road. Small group, Small like 12. Group. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I encourage you to, to, to get involved with that. And like I say, ask me any questions. And now I have uh, I got a million dollars to give away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other pants. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thanks, Ben. Uh, can you guys come up and talk a bit about Raymond and uh, Bank of Ann Arbor and uh, a little bit about uh, why you guys get involved in sponsoring things in the community? Okay. Chris? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from Raymond, which is a regional CPA and professional services firm with an awesome office here in Ann Arbor. I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues. I see Mike McCarthy in the back there. Lynn Belay, Mike and I, we should be signing somebody's tax return right now, but we're here with you. <laughs> we are happy to join Bank of Ann Arbor in giving the gift of amazing Zingerman's coffee and pastries this morning. And we're very happy to support Leaders Connect. There's something special that happens in this room. Friday, once a month on Friday morning, that we really wanted to make sure we do our part to keep it going. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. And yeah, we're going to talk about Bank of Ann Arbor. Well, there it is. Since 1996, our founding, we are responsible for more than a billion dollars in depository assets. Um, as Dr. Rob said, we're very involved in the community. We've given more than five and a half million um, in dollars to area nonprofits, and our employees have contributed more than 3,000 hours. I'm part of the Wealth and Investment Management Group, where we're responsible for another million dollars, I'm sorry, billion dollars in assets. Um, with me today, my colleagues Pat Tamlin, Mary Hayes, and Lynn Brewer. They all have the billion with them now, or they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Janice, you uh, come on up. Janice has been with Bank of Ann Arbor, and one of the things I like to do in terms of asking is, is get people to do a good asking. So, what are you asking for today, Janice? 
Well, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Rob. Of, of giving and servant leadership, you are incredible. And if anyone hasn't had the opportunity to listen to his um, interview on what he and his wife did uh, for the victims of 9-11, uh, listen to it. It's amazing. So yeah, give it up for Dr. Rob. He's incredible. <laughs> Leaders Connect not with Bank of Ann Arbor. Um, many of you might know me as a vice president and marketing manager. Um, I left earlier this year and did some traveling with my husband. So my ask now is to connect with people. Um, I'm looking for a senior leadership role in marketing and advertising, brand development, or some, uh, I'm doing a lot of freelance and consulting work. So. Thank you for coming, and I appreciate this this time. I'm here afterwards if uh, you're interested. My website is boardbrain.us. Excellent. Thank and uh, I think everybody would be greatly benefited if you need marketing services to talk to Janice and find out what she can offer you, because it's, it's great stuff. And you can just see how great the marketing is for Bank of Ann Arbor. You were responsible for that for several years. Mm -hmm. OK, great. And one other thing I'd like to do is talk about Connie, come on up. You guys know Connie, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Connie, uh, Connie, yeah. And, uh, Connie, yes, thank you for mentioning the interview I did on WEMU this week about my work at 9-11. Connie uh, was for many years uh, the head of emergency planning for the region or the state? Or? I was involved in it. I wasn't. What the head of it? I wasn't the head of it. That's a good I idea not to be the head of anything. Right? <laughs> uh, but well, Connie and I didn't know each other, but we were both in New York yes. uh, after 9-11. So maybe you could talk a little bit about just your experience as remember 9-11 this week. Well, I, I joined a disa federal disaster team thinking I was going to the next hurricane or whatever. And my first deployment was downtown New York in the financial district. So uh, when things happened, my beeper went off saying, we're, you know, get ready to go. We landed in a, in a surrealistic place without lights and clean lights and generators and all kinds of things. Nobody left to find, but there were all these workers and firefighters and police. They're all searching for their buddies. And so they would come into our aid station. A lot of them had coughs because it was very dusty. And now we're seeing downwind many, many lung problems. And so we were giving a lot of breathing treatments and taking care of all the worker bees that were watering the still burning fires and digging in the rubble and taking care of the site, including treasury agents. And we said, why did they think? Well, there was a bolt of gold in one of the banks. They were guarding it. But um, they would all come in, and then suddenly they would unload all the pain that they had. So we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling just to reflect back when they told us their incredible stories. So we did a lot of it, those different kinds of things. So I ended up doing a lot of counseling, too, and, and it was very gratifying. And uh, I've since been to hurricanes, but that, that was the most <laughs> surreal. You ready to go? <laughs> <laughs> North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, my team is there already. Well, thank you, Connie. Appreciate it. part of this uh, group, emergency massive group, for many, many years, and is now uh, claim to be retired, but I think you're, you're busier than ever from what I can see. <laughs> and one other thing we want to do is talk about the great things that are happening in Ann Arbor. And we have these, a lot of cities have serial killers, and you know, we don't want to have any of those, but we have, we're blessed in this community, we have serial entrepreneurs. <laughs> and they're not making cereal, they're actually starting businesses. And some work out great, and you know, you, you get that million, and others like you, you give away a million, and but you keep going. So, Jen Baird, come on up and tell us about your newest serial endeavor, okay? <laughs> never had that. I've never been compared to a serial killer before. I don't think so, but I'm probably going to be a serial lifesaver. That's the goal. 
Um, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. Say your name again. Oh yes, Jen Baird. I'm the CEO of a company called Fifth Eye. Fifth Eye just got spun out um, of Michigan Medicine. We developed some technology. Our team developed some technology. I got lucky enough to find them and the technology at the right moment. Um, that's taking a single lead of EKG and using it to detect hemodynamic instability and predict patient deterioration. And some of the places that we expect to apply this is in emergency medicine, ICUs, step down and tele units. And we're probably, we're on track to have the software developed and submitted to the FDA around the end of the year. Um, and of course, I, I, I like giving away money, but I also raise money, <laughs> and that's my main job. Um, but I'm excited about the opportunity to be involved with all the clinicians that are doing these kinds of things with a totally new technology. I'd love to connect with people who have um, different viewpoints on what the need is and that kind of thing, because we're constantly developing our network of um, clinicians that are part of this process. There's so many ways to be involved, and that was one of the reasons I was interested in hearing what you guys had to say this morning. Thank you very much, Jim. We got other serial entrepreneurs out there. I see Chuck Newman. He, he started out. Did you invent post toasties? Is that what it was originally? <laughs> yeah. Ten years ago. What? what? And uh, where's Neil Clinton? Uh, Neil is uh, a uh, physicist, and he's been a serial entrepreneur. Developed uh, portable CT scanners, which you probably guys use, and he's also now working on proton therapy for cancer treatment. So we have some really interesting folks in, in Ann Arbor and doing some amazing things. I could go down the line, and uh, every every one of you has some amazing things going on. But we're gonna we're gonna now turn the program over to uh, Rob McCurdy and his associates at the Emergency Medicine uh, Physicians Med E P M G right Emergency yeah. Physician Medicine Group, and uh, I've actually. Known Rob since he started in about '86 in emergency medicine and in uh, developing leadership role, and now he's uh, kind of gone through the ranks and has risen to a very important role of chief of staff at St. Joe's, and also has a, a leadership role for the for the group. And uh, I don't know how many of you have had the misfortune to go for emergency medicine, but if you go and to, to St. Joe's, you really get the highest quality and you feel like you're really taken care of and understood and not shuffled about. So I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the group. And uh, Rob, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourself and then you guys can all introduce yourself. And we're gonna have an open forum where they're gonna say a few little bit, but then going about just answering your questions, everything you want to know about sex, but, oh, no, sorry, about emergency medicine, but we're afraid to ask. Is that the name of the, 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 the probably too many people don't remember that book either. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Uh, lots of friendly faces out there. And, and I just want to point out, uh, Connie Doyle is very humble. So I just want to point out that she is actually one of the pioneers for emergency medicine. has been a role model for all of us. And uh, really appreciative that she's here. So, um, yeah, so can, I, can I add on to absolutely. that? Yeah, because <laughs> when she stopped working in the emergency department, she was the longest continuous worker in emergency medicine in the country. Wow. Oh. Oh. How, many, how many stitches is that? <laughs> I, I don't have the fingers. <laughs> so Lots of stitches. Probably conservatively, I'm sure she's seen over 100,000 patients in her career. So wow. it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Molly Brown has nothing on this one. <laughs> so um, so uh, my name is Robert McCurdy. I grew up in Ann Arbor, uh, Go Pioneer. Um, and I've been on staff at St. Joe's since uh, 93 and a variety of different leadership roles. Uh, but like any good leader, I surround myself with people who are smarter and brighter and more interesting than myself. And so I will allow these uh, people to introduce themselves. Thanks, Rob. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Simmons. Hold, hold, everybody's got a hold right, 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 yeah, there you go. A little closer? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Usually I'm speaking without a microphone and I fill I fill the room pretty well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my name is Stephanie Simmons. I'm an ER doc at St. Joe's. I came to Ann Arbor in 1995 as an undergrad and stuck. So I'm now a lifer, go blue. Um, and I've worked at uh, St. Joseph Mercy Hospital, Celine Hospital for my uh, initial clinical work over the last 12 years um, after residency. 
So my uh, particular interest in, in leadership um, is uh, employee engagement and patient experience and the interplay between engagement, burnout, and the performance of bedside skills. So not so much the diagnosis and treatment in, of disease as far as, um, as well as more the communication and connection with patients um, by clinicians. Uh, and that is what I'm doing now. Good morning. I got into uh, Me. medicine. I'll get there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, has anybody read the Start With Why book? Yeah, so I'm starting with my why. Okay. So my why is that I, um, I thought that I could do it at least as good as the doctors that were treating my sister when she was sick when I was in high school. And uh, there, were some, there were some missteps in her care. And I, you know, being the rebellious young punk U of M guy at 19, <laughs> I was like, well, I can do it at least as well as those guys do it. Um, and so over the years, I've had many opportunities to witness family members and just ask a couple of key questions of the doctors or the medical staff that have really uh, improved the care. And so it's just reinforced my why of the, I'm into this to help doctors be better doctors. Um, and so that has sort of taken me to where I am now. And my name is Keenan Bora. I am the, uh, I'm a practicing ER doctor. And I also um, have a role now with uh, Envision Healthcare, which is the, the, I think the largest provider of medical services in the country. Is right. there? Um, and I'm the national co-chair for quality for emergency medicine. You also do some stuff on talks, is it? Uh, yeah, so I also, I mean, yeah, so we talk about serial entrepreneurs. I guess I'm a serial uh, hat wearer. So <laughs> I also, um, I work at the uh, uh, Michigan Poison Control Center. I did a fellowship in medical toxicology, so I deal with um, anybody that's called the Poison Center hotline. You've dealt with um, one of my staff, and um, I still take calls with them a couple times a month, and I, I see patients in the, uh, in the hospitals, in the ERs, who have... Uh, been either overdosed or accidental poisonings or uh, ingestions, things like that, uh, in addition to the ER work. So thanks for reminding me. Uh, good morning. My name, sorry. Well, I was going to say, you know, these little added things. Keenan is, is one of the world's great gamers, but not electric <laughs> gamers, right? But so board you, games. Board games. So if you want to know what to play at your cottage, you know, when you know, it's a rainy day. It's true. I, he true. gave me a tip this summer. It's worked out really well. Oh, did you, did you try it? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the name of it, but it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was, it was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Lee Benjamin. I am an emergency physician and uh, pediatrician, and I spend a lot of my time in the pediatric emergency department. Uh, I feel there's no greater gift uh, than a parent allowing me to care for their, their child. Um, and uh, I have ultimate respect for those parents who just kind of give us control and and say go. So I have a deep connection with uh, pediatrics. I've already uh, uh, shared with Doug that I'm going to give a, a week of my time to help staff camp, oh, and we're going to we're going to we're going to bring him into the group. And um, as far as my reflections, I I expected a good turnout and, and tremendous energy today. What I didn't expect to leave with was a discussion about self awareness in high school. <laughs> Camp and sharp tools. But I think the three things go together fantastic. Well, my uh, my interest, other than pediatric emergency uh, medicine, is really how emergency medicine, as the face of hospitals into the community, how we serve as the front door, and how we relate with healthcare in a more broad picture, and how we can collaborate with uh, all the resources and capabilities within the community, within the hospital, to really elevate care for all of our patients in our community. I wonder if we could maybe just have everybody kind of say what their little bit of, you know, what you, why you're here, why you wanted to share with the group, what it was, the messages you wanted to pass on or whatever. We'll answer questions, but just give, you know, a couple minutes. I'm sure. Um, so uh, why I'm here today is because I um, initially, I think the, the conversation was going to focus primarily on the opiate epidemic and opioids. Um, and so I talked with Rob, and Rob knows that, and, and Rob and Rob both know that I um, work at the Poison Control Center, and so we see a certain element of that, and, um, you know, we're always the first ones to become aware that a particular batch of heroin or drugs has been tainted because of the flow of drugs across the 
um, across the country up from uh, the southern border to Chicago and then across we kind of can track and so we'll know like in 2007 when the fentanyl first became uh, popular in the uh, heroin supply we knew about that and so that was you know that was my why I initially came here and then we started um, we broadened the topic out and we're just going to sort of talk about emergency medicine in general um, and I, I have a lot of strong opinions on that I think as we all do um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, my, my undergraduate degree, I, I went to um, University of Michigan and I, I got a degree in chemistry, but I also went to the residential college and they allowed me to make a degree. Um, and so I studied cross-cultural healing and I focused specifically on similarities and differences between healing uh, ideas and systems from around the world. And I realized that the United States is a, as a Western medicine doesn't have a concept of health. Um, we have a concept of, of that as sort of a lack of disease, but that doesn't really help us strive for anything. Um, and so it's been a part of my goal to try to implement health concepts and well-being, even in the life of an emergency doctor, which can be kind of tricky, you know, and it's not always like, you know, you're not sitting there doing chest compressions telling them that they got to stop smoking. It's nothing like that. It's, <laughs> you know, you, is there, are there ways that you can help people be healthier during the you know few hours that we have with them um, and and so that's that's why I'm here now is to sort of talk with you guys about what you can expect and what you can get out of your time even in the emergency department thanks you can't give what you don't have and a lot of what I do in my work is actually help our clinicians our healthcare providers develop their own internal set of resources, um, their resilience, so that they have something to give to their patients at the bedside. So <clears throat> one of the great criticisms of medicine is the lack of communication and connection that healthcare providers have with their patients. Patients don't feel heard and listened to, and they feel like there is a distance um, in the clinical realm with between the clinician and the patient and and some of that is protective uh, for the clinician and part of it is destructive it sort of corrodes the spiritual you know reason why many people go into healthcare, and yet a clinician will lose that connection to why they went into their field in the first place so um, the reason I'm here today is to share some of the work that we're doing as, as a company and as a group to help connect our clinicians back to the mission of medicine that the reason they went in the first place. That, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges in daily practice in emergency medicine. Usually when I say I'm, in, I'm an ER doc, when I'm meeting somebody, the first reaction is, ooh, that must be hard. Yes. So you see a lot of bad things happen uh, to your community and to good people, and that's very difficult to come to grips with on a personal level. You're often doing that with a full bladder and an empty stomach for hours on end. And the only thing I can and relate it to is I, um, I waited tables and was a sous chef for many years in high school and, and college, and it's, it's sort of like working a double shift, but without a break in between, you know, as far as like constantly being on the run. So you have the physical challenge, you have the emotional challenge, and uh, our healthcare, our clinicians start to, to develop defense mechanisms against that stress, some of which are adaptive and some of which are not. And so I try to help our clinicians develop their adaptive coping mechanisms and maybe retool some of those maladaptive coping me mechanisms. So I'm here because Rob asked me to come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so am but, I, uh, but different Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as uh, in my various leadership roles, so as a medical director and then department chair and now chief of staff, a lot of my role has been interacting with the community and especially patients and families when things didn't go as expected. And so that's one of my thoughts is to answer questions. I think people have some misconceptions about what emergency services is, what it can offer. Um, Lee and I recently met with uh, Congresswoman Dingle. You know, things that were really big on her agenda were, you know, how is the ACA affecting emergency care? Um, she's a, a big advocate for behavioral health services, and many of you probably know that uh, 
you know, since, especially since the state hospital was closed in the 90s, that it's a real challenge to take care of patients with mental illness. Um, and uh, we have kids who stay in our emergency department for up to a week in an emergency room waiting for a bed somewhere, and adults even two or three days, so that's a big issue for us. And then I think uh, we touched on the opioid epidemic. We're happy to talk about you know, how we got here and, and what we're doing to, to try and uh, turn things around for that. But we do want to leave it up to, to you. We don't know what interests you as a community and what you would want to know. So kind of, uh, we're here for you and whatever you'd like to ask us. Okay, so um, with that, uh, why don't we just start with throwing out some topics, not, not necessarily questions, but what are on your mind, you know, we mentioned opioids. What, what are some of the just the topics, and we could address those, and then pick up some specific questions. Yeah, stand up and say your name, and uh, what, you, what you got. Joe Hines, and the questions without a specific question, physician burnout, and and specifically as it relates to electronic health records and the clerical burden on all of physicians, um, and how you're coping with that. And it probably dovetails into some of the adaptive uh, skills that you teach. So, physician burnout. Okay, thanks, Joe. Yes. Carol Cam, and I'd love it if you could address anything that you see as the special challenges of dealing with seniors and the elderly and the elderly population. Great. Yes. Hi, Elizabeth Michelle. Kind of along those same lines, um, I'd love to talk about end of life decision making. Um, particularly with communication um, between patients and families and the patient, or clinicians. Dave Beth. Kelly Parkinson. Uh, I would like to hear some follow-up on the ACA and the impact of what's going on with emergency medicine in the end. Okay. Fred? Uh, Fred Brown. I'd like to know about costs, healthcare costs, and how, when you come to an emergency room, why can't you tell a patient how much it's going to cost them? Great question. Alex, I'd like to know just in your day-to-day uh, -day life, you, you see a very compelling and tragic beginning to a lot of stories. You probably never get to hear the end of those stories a lot because they move on to longer-term care. Like, how do you do that? It's probably for now. Oh, yeah, for now, for you guys to. Uh, <laughs> somebody take, take notes. I, I, okay. I missed what was the. I think we've just gotten like the first six chapters of a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a list. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one more. Yeah, last yeah, one round. Um, disillusionment. Um, I have a daughter who is now an e emergency medicine doctor in St. Louis, Washington. But she started out in plastic surgery because everyone said you're smart go there. <laughs> and then she got to her fourth year surgery and said, I'm going to be mm -hmm. Because I can control my life as opposed to having the medical system control me. And I just want to hear your thoughts on, you know, in the self-awareness. She went through the whole process of becoming self-aware and made the decision to change to your field because she got disillusioned with the rest of medicine. All right, so we'll let you take some of those on, and if you can uh, maybe... Well, that'll be the first... a great note-taker. First five minutes. <laughs> this is, uh, unlike my class, I'd like you to use your cell phones, take pictures, take video clips, send them to me, or, or post them on social media, because we like to share this information. The whole video will be up uh, sometime next week, uh, but we want to also encourage you to take pictures and share those kind of things and let people know what these folks are, are giving us. So uh, where do you want to start? Until which time? Until what time do we go? We had about um, till about ten to nine. Okay. So about fifty minutes. Or so. Okay. Right. So I can start with Joe's question. So Joe, you know, is a good, great plant. He, he worked for EPNG for a long time. So his question was about how the EMR has affected our work life. And so, uh, so I started when I started emergency well, medicine. Rob, what, what's an EMR? Oh, I'm sorry. Electronic medical <laughs> record. For those of you who may not know. Uh, that uh, when I first started my career, everything was on paper, everything. You know, we really didn't have any electronic communication, <coughs> very little of it. And so there's definitely pluses and minuses to the EMR. I think most of us would say we want, never want to go back to the days of paper. Um, so, you know, there was a time when uh, if I wanted to find out something about a patient that I was seeing, about some prior visit or whatever, we'd call down medical records and it would take about half an hour and you'd get this huge stack of you know, charts this way, and then you filter another half an hour and find a little piece of information that you wanted. So one of the big 
uh, advantages to having an EMR is the ability to pick out the little pieces of information right away. And that's been really helpful and kind of streamline care and make things, you know, especially for coordination of there's a lot of repeating, you know, tests that have been done already because patients are not really good about relaying that kind of information. I think the one thing that we're starting to gain with EMRs is, you know, up to about five years ago, none of them talked to each other. So if you were at the U of M or another hospital, I, it was very hard to get access to those records. So right now we have what's called Great Lakes Health Connect. It's uh, a state initiative, so it has, it's voluntary, but most hospitals have signed up for this, so it makes it a little bit easier for me to electronically get into a record from another hospital and, and get some information from another patient on another patient. Uh, so we're making some progress there. Um, you know, I think if people ask about what with the downside of the EMR, I think it's um, it takes away from the bedside contact with the patients to some degree. Some of it's the EMR, a lot of it's just all the regulatory and compliance stuff that we have to do and the stuff that we do that's non-value added to patients to get paid for stuff. It's just crazy. Um, but, um, you know, once we started with the EMR, you know, you, we found ourselves, you know, talking to patients and putting stuff in the computer, talking to patients and this barrier. One of the things that we've done in the ER, so we have scribes now, so that's taken a lot of that away. So a scribe is typically somebody who's interested in you know, going into medicine, they graduated, they want to they're applying for med school, and so they join us for a couple years, follows around, they take all the notes for us. Sometimes, some places will do computer order entry for that. Um, and so that's helped kind of uh, reestablish some of the connection that we have for patients. Um, the EMR uh, was supposed to be something that helped provide safety for patients. I think the jury's still out on that. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things, little windows that pop up constantly when you try to order things. And, you know, after your 20th window pops up on a single patient, then you start to, it starts to be like alarm fatigue. And, and you know, it, I'm not sure how helpful it is. Uh, sometimes it's just a barrier to getting, you know, patient things done with patients. But I would say on a whole, the EMR has been a good thing, especially as we evolve and we have more connectivity with, with other providers. What was the next question that came up? Seniors, elderly population. All right, anyone you guys want to take all of that one? Well, I want to, I, I, I do, want I want to add a little bit, yeah. So, um, when I first started out using the health the electronic health records, it was exactly as Rob said. You go into the room the way that you always do, but then you feel like, oh, God, i got to rush away, and you spend all this time over here away from the patient. And now we have the these um, wireless computers that are on wheels, and you can actually use it to your benefit once you've sort of gotten through the initial you know future shock. Uh, you can wheel the computer in and make sure that it's not between you and the patient, and then you tell, you know, you sort of hear the story and you say, okay, I'm going to dictate into this microphone and I want you to listen. And that's your chance to make sure if there's a part of it that you think is important that I'm not saying, I want you to tell me as I'm dictating it. And then we can talk about that. And then I dictate the whole story. And then I go to the medical decision making part and I say, okay, now I'm going to tell you what I'm planning on doing. And you listen to that. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, you can, you can ask me that. So I think, you know, it's one of these, you know, it is, a, it is a, you know, it can be a tool of destruction, but it can actually also be really useful um, in making sure that the patients understand what it is that you're planning on doing. And certainly when, you, when, when you're talking about seniors, one of the things that I think we hear all the time when we ask what medications you're on is, I don't know, look in the record. Um, and I think that that is like, it's invaluable. Um, to, to have that. We certainly love it when you come in with all of your medications neatly typed out on a card. Um, but if, you know, barring that, um, it, you know, having the history, having previous labs, and as Rob said, not having to wait, you know, 45 minutes or an hour for them to come up for medical records, uh, it's incredibly useful. But that there are some specifics to the senior population in terms of the needs after they're discharged or prior to being discharged. And so we've, we've got a couple of different, uh, like I think uh, us and St. Mary's in Livonia and a couple of other places have set up um, specific parts of the emergency department that are dedicated to seniors. So we have, the floors are a little bit different. 
They're a little bit, um, they're not quite as slick and they're also a little bit softer. There are handrails everywhere. Um, so we do some um, accessibility issues in there. Um, we make sure that we have a screening process for, uh, for uh, dementia and early cognitive defects that all the seniors go through. So there are some things that we do um, that we've been improving on since we opened up the senior ED, what, six years ago? At least. Yeah. I have a quick question, just a background, and maybe you could handle this, uh, Steph, and that is, uh, can you just help us understand how this is structured? Who's in, who's in the ER? Who do we talk to? Because it's confusing, I think, when people walk in, and the first experience, of course, is that front desk when you, when you enter the hospital. So could you just give us, like, a you know, behind the scenes? Happy to. Well, one of, one of the great things that we've been able to do uh, at St. Joe is the first person you talk to actually may be the front desk, but maybe a greeter, so that when you pull your car up, somebody's there to help you come in and to help you navigate those first few moments. You'll come to a podium, and you'll be asked to give a word or two about why you're there um, and your name for a, a quick <coughs> registration so we can start to get you into the system. And then we'll do what's called a quick look triage where one of our nurses will ta uh, take the vital signs and hear a little bit about the complaint uh, that brings you to the emergency department and triage you into one of our different areas. So what we've done is rather than just having one pool of beds in the emergency department that is shared by all the incoming patients, we do a bit of a, um, a discernment of what the likely level of service that's needed upon arrival is. Um, we do have a dedicated senior emergency department that has additional resources. And so uh, folks who are over the age of 65 uh, and, and relatively stable, meaning they're not needing um, emergent resuscitation, will go to that senior emergency department. In addition to the services that Keenan mentioned, uh, we all do additional education. Um, to help take care of our, our senior patients, including education on polypharmacy. Uh, you know, it's, we, we say you get a drug per decade of life, and so many of our um, octogenarians and nonagenarians are on more than eight or nine medications, and the interplay of those medications is an emergent property, right? All in itself in the medical care. Uh, so that's one area you may go to. If you are likely to be discharged, and you are stable on arrival, you may go to our rapid assessment area, rapid treatment area, where you'll stay vertical, okay? So if you come into the emergency department vertical, we want you to stay vertical. We don't want to put you horizontal in a bed and keep you there. So we'll do a rapid assessment where a nurse and a clinician will go in together, and I, I purposely say clinician because our physician assistant and nurse practitioner colleagues are an essential part of this area of the emergency department. Our clinician will come in and assess you at the same time as our nursing staff and determine what the needs are for the evaluation. After that initial assessment, you'll go to the results pending area, which looks like a waiting room, but isn't, okay? This is a, um, a recliner with a spot for your family member to stay with you. And from that area, you'll be taken to your diagnostics. So um, your blood work will be drawn to send to the lab. You'll be taken to the x-ray suite, to the um, CT suite, to MRI, et cetera, whatever those um, workup that's needed will be. And then you'll be pulled into a consult room to go over the results of that evaluation and likely discharged. If at any point during that evaluation it becomes clear that there's a different outcome to your visit, to what you're being observed overnight or admitted to the hospital, then we transition you to the main part of the emergency department. And that brings us to the last area, which is our resuscitation and general uh, population emergency department. We have uh, five resuscitation and uh, trauma rooms that are set up for our sickest patients. And then we, we have um, a suite of rooms that have the capability to take care of our, our sickest patients, but maybe a little less uh, room you know, to do that. So um, those are for our patients who are unstable um, or who come in when some of these other areas are not open because of our patient flow. 
uh, or uh, need emergent resuscitation. So you, at that point, it's more of what I think folks view as of a traditional ED experience where they're coming in, they're being placed in a bed, um, having a triage process with the nurse, and then the clinician comes in, sits down, takes history and physical in the bed that you're going to be staying in, and you're coming and going back to that room. And when does George Clooney come in? <laughs> <laughs> I always say I'm we're right a lot less attractive <laughs> <laughs> than the doctors on the TV show, and there's a lot less fooling around in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could it's, fun, it's funny you ask because oh, actually, actually, you look George, so much like George. <laughs> George Clooney played me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thanked him. <laughs> could you talk to us, Ali, about how that might be different for a child that comes in? Absolutely. Um, so our take on the pediatric population is we know where they're going to go. They're going to go to a pediatric bed, and we have in our emergency department, which is very rare for a community emergency department, a nested pediatric area within the greater emergency department, which we may refer to as the ED, not that kind of ED, but the emergency <laughs> department. Um, and only people over 60 get that there you joke. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so the, we have a process of direct bedding. So we don't believe in triage, which historically is a tool to identify who is the sickest patient, who needs the most resources, and we tend to them first. We know if a patient, a pediatric patient walks in, they look pretty good, they're coming to our pediatric unit, and we don't ask any questions. We take them right back, we put them into a bed. The very first person they may see, other than the people who walk them back, may be me. That's who they're there to see. Um, we do triage just as a nursing tool after the fact, our average time to triage for a pediatric patient is negative 11 minutes, which means we've seen the patient, we've started the evaluation, we've started managing them before they've ever even gotten triaged. So it's uh, a bit different, which we can, we can do that because we, we have, uh, well, specific people who are looking out for the kids, specific policies, processes. If they're really sick, they'll come into one of the resuscitation bays and one of the wonderful things at St. Joe's is we have a pediatrician in the emergency department who meets at the bedside with the emergency physician to kind of bring all those resources and capabilities to the bedside for the sickest of the pediatric patients. Now, I want to take a bit of a left turn from the pediatrics to the geriatric questions. And this goes into end-of-life discussions. And it's a tremendous, tremendous um, arena to get a grasp of. And, and just to kind of... As I look at healthcare delivery as a whole, as the emergency department, as simply one of the other cogs in the wheel, we have to recognize the tremendous impact of our aging population and what that does to our emergency department, what that does to our floor patients, our ICUs, our trauma service. Our most common patient on our trauma service are geriatric patients who have fallen because they can suffer significant injuries with minimal impact. They have a lot of medical, what we refer to as comorbidities or other issues that have to be addressed. So this is a, a, a brewing uh, a problem that there's not a great answer to right now, but we all recognize it's an issue. Uh, we have specific physicians who are trained in geriatric emergency medicine. Uh, we have others, geri geriatric internal medicine physicians who staff our hospital floors who can provide specialized care to this population. We have case managers who understand the community network and can get these geriatric patients plugged into the resources and the capabilities to deliver what's needed on the other side of the emergency care, on the other side of the stabilization throughout their hospital stay. So it's a very complex web. And I think the key to, to any web is having someone in the middle of the web who understands what's out there. I think as we ask questions, for example, uh, adolescent behavioral health, and why is this patient in my emergency department for several days? You start asking questions and you understand there are so many people doing so much, but they're all working in silos. And a big part of what we need to understand in medicine is how do we collaborate? How do we even identify those resources and capabilities? And how do we develop that network? How do we create that web to really utilize everything we have to, to answer those, those problems? So before I take your question, I want to point out, I want to point out very quickly, I think we're here as much to hear from you as to share what we experience. We work in a silo. We very rarely have this opportunity to interface with the community. So please, if there's something that you can share with us, something you need to hear, 
stand up, raise your hand, because I think we're here to learn from you as much as to share share what we do. Uh, a follow-up to that, I have two elderly, in two elderly in-laws and an elderly mother, and we, my husband and I have been in an emergency many times with all of them. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is that seniors often present very, you know, cognitively fine, but they're not really. They do a really good job of masking it. So I would just encourage you to include the broader family in family conferences and discussions just because just because the senior nods and says, yep, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Yep. Thank you for saying that out loud. The comment was oftentimes when seniors are in the emergency department or in any medical situation, I suspect, uh, they may do a good job of, of making it seem like they're alert and they understand everything that's going on, which in fact they, they may not be. And I think it's really important, we do a, at St. Joe's specifically, we do a, a very good job of having patient representation in our committees who can share that voice of, of the patient and the patient's advocate because it's crucial. So thank you very much for, for that comment. I just want to follow up with the, uh, the prop here. So uh, yeah. this is my walking stick, and uh, I need it because I have a neurological injury that is causing limping. And you notice I didn't use it a lot of the time, but I did bring it in. So the idea, I see this with a lot of my friends, is that we don't want to admit that we have aging problems or problems at all. And so we... we <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> that, that caught your attention. Uh, so the, what do they say? The pride goeth before the fall. So I wonder if you, what tips do you, just on the fall issue, what do you tell people, you know, when they come in and, and how to uh, prevent that and uh, what they should be thinking about? Anybody want that one? Sure. I'll get rid of this cup here that fell. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going quickly back to the cognitive issue. So it's really interesting. So we do a pretty good screening for dementia. And it's really interesting that we pick up stuff that even the family hasn't picked up on yet. I have a father-in-law who's going through Alzheimer's right now. It's very interesting how things change and how things wax and wane. He can be compl almost completely attuned to what's going on around him on some days and other days has no clue. Um, and so it waxes and wanes and of course when you're ill that always complicates things too. Uh, so for fall, so it's really interesting um, when I talk to patients and families when they fall and a lot of times they have all the tools that they have that they're supposed to be using at home. So they have walkers or they have, and they're not using them. I mean, that that's one of the things. Um, I think as primary care physicians, we need to do a better job of recognizing when some people start to have issues with their balance. Because it happens to everybody as you age, it's just part of how your neurologic system starts to, to age also, is that you don't sense balance as well. Um, it's just inevitable at some point that you're gonna not be able to do all the things that you used to be able to do. And so I think we need to do a better job. And it's different for everybody. I mean, you know, we've got people who are 100 years old that still run, and people who are 70 who can barely, you know, walk in a straight line. Uh, so, you know, it's different for everyone. But you know, what I've noticed is that, like you mentioned, people don't want to acknowledge their deficits and uh, will often do workarounds for things that they should be doing because it just doesn't feel good to be in a walker or have to use a wheelchair all the time, or you know, just this once I got to go to the bathroom, I'm gonna, you know, forget my walker or whatever, and try and get to the bathroom. I mean, there are things you can do like protective, there's protective garments and that kind of stuff, but really, you know, it starts to affect your lifestyle too, and you have to think about all these things. Uh, getting back to your asking the family thing, they actually there's some research that just came out recently that um, says that. The more you like the particular doctor or the more connected the doctor feels with the family members, the more likely they are to provide a key history element um, to the diagnosis of it. And, and so I guess, uh, you know, my sort of, my ask of, of you is that uh, even if you don't like the doctor, <laughs> that uh, you, you don't feel uh, like feel empowered to provide any history elements that you feel are important to uh, to taking care of like you know like you know it may, it may not be necessarily a mental status thing it might be the case like even with my 
my in-laws recently was that I had, I had to provide the key history element that, oh, she just had a week of diarrhea for my mother-in-law when she was in seeing uh, her PCP regarding some joint pain, uh, which may not seem important to you, but is, it helps us really contextualize what's going on. So let's take a minute. Uh, the the uh, group here has asked for feedback. And I wonder if you could just maybe huddle with uh, uh, like three, at a, three or four at a time, Steve, if you can turn around with, with these folks, and just say, what are some of the messages you wanted to pass on to these docs that would help you or they should be aware of or would be good for you to get off your chest that they would be aware of? So maybe just turn around, talk to some folks, and uh, we'll give you about three minutes, and then we'll, we'll hear some feedback, OK? Excellent. Yes, and I would like to make sure that we, because I heard a couple of questions about burnout and disillusionment, I would like to speak on that. Alright, we're back for time, so uh, we got to start over here with, uh, wrap it up. Uh, has anybody come farther today to join us than Mount Pleasant? No, Alright, so Steve, I'm going to let you go. Uh, so Steve, uh, Rocky, is it all right with the interest? Yeah, okay. So uh, Steve is, uh, drove me this morning in the fog from Mount Pleasant, which is a, a big deal. So Steve, could you just could you stand up and talk about what your group was and give us feedback? Well, we were, we were talking about, brought up about artificial intelligence. My role, my role does play, and my role does it play within the emergency process. And if you're not very big role or any at all, but you embrace having that more so can you put it in play. Even though you may be open up to changing the model and, and releasing more so of taking away the human element. But where does it play artificial intelligence? I know you use EMR, I know the capability is there to use artificial intelligence within that environment. Would you embrace that? Okay. Be more so. Yeah. 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 Hot dog. Um, so um, we actually we want that um, more and more there are these things, predictive, um, predictive qu text, predictive questions that will pull different elements uh, behind the scenes from the health record and then you know, put something in front of the doctor like, hey, um, I noticed that the patient had a, you know, a, has a history of diabetes and has this, you know, should you consider ordering this testing? Um, and that, that stuff is, exists, but is like we're right at the vanguard for that. Um, and so I think that um, it, it will, it is coming. Um, and I think that as we, um, as we sort of had a, a bit of an adjustment to initially the concept of the electronic health record, I think that there's going to be a significant task on all providers to be able to um, hang on to their ego and say like, well, maybe, maybe this computer has actually got something. Um, maybe this is a good idea. I was just going to add on, um, there's already work being done in this space, but the EMR has really leveraged big data. So hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points are now being entered into predictive algorithms. So the, the, the cardiac monitor, when they put the stickers on the patient and they plug it in and there's a monitor above, the monitor may be, may be able to predict that your patient is going to decompensate greatly within the next 20 to 30 minutes based on what we've been following in our vital signs and our predictive algorithms. It's coming, it's going to be. Jen, is this? Is there you go, Jen. It's can, can you speak to that a little bit <laughs> more? Just to, yeah, just that's, to, that's our IP, man. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> not a secret. So, oh, oh, oh. thank you. Hey, hey, breaking yeah. out of the yeah. 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 He's going to save me from grabbing, but. Good thing there's emergency people. We're getting <laughs> You're going to fall. This is the place to do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. I've got lots of help right here. <laughs> um, our data is showing that we can predict that seven hours in advance of them decompensating. And it's based off of stuff that a really great trained person can't see, mm -hmm. right? Because an EKG is that, you know, bouncy little line that disappears. And we're looking at a couple dozen features that are not even in the time domain. So you couldn't look at them and recognize it. But when you look at hundreds of thousands of windows of people's um, heart rate and heartbeat, you can see these patterns and the machine learning picks that out. And so it's really interesting to give 
somebody like these guys, just a heads up that that patient you guys mentioned earlier, you've got elderly patients coming in and you don't know how bad off are they. Well, this is a way of detecting that because one of the ways to think about it is your heart is um, managing your, your body's responses to problems. So a simple example would be if somebody had fallen and has some internal bleeding going on, um, you might not know that right away and it might be hard to actually pick up, but your heart is gonna know that and your heart is gonna be working harder and that's the kinds of things that we're actually picking up is the heart actually working harder. Um, the challenge with vital signs is that they are relatively late indicators because your body is so good at compensating for problems. Uh, and so vital signs are great, but they, they actually indicate things later because your body is compensating. So that's the kinds of stuff that we're trying to bring to the mix um, and give those tools. But it's not gonna replace a doctor, I can tell you that. Because we, we can only say, hey, the body's working extra hard, it's got an autonomic system burden that's, that's excessive. Um, you need to go dig deeper and figure out why that's happening, but hopefully you can do that sooner. Thank you. Um, I, before we get into some of the other feedback, there are a couple points you guys wanted to make. Uh, one was about the opioid epidemic, and you can do that, and then also about physician uh, wellness, and we'll go from there and take some more feedback. We'll do the physician wellness one first. Yeah. So we had a couple of, of questions that dovetailed into the issue of, of burnout or disillusionment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to speak for a moment on that. Um, we all need fire, right? Uh, and, and passion and interest to engage in our careers and our lives, and that's not unique to medicine. So there's, um, there's, some, there's always that fire burning, right? That you have to, to feed a little bit. There's some predisposing factors, both in the selection of who goes to medical school and who gets into medical school, and then the training uh, that folks go to that um, adds kindling to that fire, okay? So um, we're looking, we, we often choose very uh, perfectionist, workaholic uh, folks to, to go to medical school. And as um, entrepreneurs and leaders, you guys may recognize some of these traits in yourself. The, the tools that we develop to survive our training in medical school and residency, uh, things like we're going to work very hard, we're going to be perfectionists about how we get the work done, we're going to believe we can do it on our own and we can do things that the average person cannot, okay, and that we're going to be able to do this independently without help. Those are all tools that you need to be able to take out and use to be trained in, in medicine. You better believe that you can do something on your own independently that not everybody can do when a trauma comes in and you're putting a tube in somebody's chest who's awake and suffering, okay? That's hard. You have to be able to develop that tool and have it in your belt. If you then use that hammer that you develop in your training for every situation, how well does Lone Ranger perfectionist workaholism work in relationships. I'm a parent of a 13 year old girl. Okay, how well does that work in my relationship with her? Not at all. And so um, you have a really great campfire built by the selection and training. And then you have the gasoline of everyday practice thrown on that campfire. And that's why you don't just have this like effective fire burnt that burns inside. Sometimes you get a forest fire, right? And some of those stresses are, the EMR, we talked about all the positives, okay? Um, we actually have it fairly easy with the EMR and emergency medicine, and I still will have 97 charts to review and sign after a shift when I'm working with a PA, 97. That's not time that I'm on the clock. Okay? It's much worse for other specialties, especially primary care. That's a huge burnout factor. How do you balance your work life and your personal life when you have so many other factors? You have one bad, bad case. Okay? We, we see pain and suffering every day. Um, if a three-year-old dies while you're working on them, okay, that, that, that takes you from zero to 60 in in seven seconds with regards to burnout. It takes a while to recover your personal equanimity, right, after something like that happens. Then you have all of the, 
regulatory things that are very well meaningly put into place to help us improve our care, but add an additional burden of documentation that are, is not always actually serving the purpose that it's designed to. To your question, Fred, about costs, we are operating in this incredibly complex payer system where the insurance that a patient has may not cover their emergency care, and I have no way to have access to that information. Nor do I know what the charges are going to be other than my physician fee charge. I can tell you what that's going to be very easily. Can I tell you what your insurance is gonna cover out of your CT scan and what it's not? No, I cannot. So we have a lot of frustrations in being able to communicate with our patients the information they need to make informed decisions about their care. And so all of that is gasoline on that fire that's already been kindled, tindered, and set. So how do we help our clinicians damp that down so that it's that slow burn you need to maintain your passion for your career is a real struggle. Disillusionment is real and I think it's actually very interesting that your daughter started out in plastic surgery and came to emergency medicine. My sister-in-law is a plastic surgeon and um, you know the grass is always greener, right? So uh, both of us will compare back and forth our careers and our, our jobs and, and sometimes have those grasses greener moments. I actually started in residency as an anesthesiologist and switched to emergency medicine. Many people switch into anesthesiology, uh, you know, so I, I think it's, it's more about finding the fit between your personalities and your quirks and the specialty that you're practicing in. There is a reason why there are stereotypical personalities that go into different specialties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll come in on that. Yes, please. Earlier, Steve talked about our workshop, and uh, this, this dovetails with that because uh, I do executive coaching and career coaching, and I use this model where there's four circles, and we try to help people find the sweet spot. One is passion, which you're talking about fire. The other, what are the great skills that you have? So if you have the skill of being a good, uh, hitting the nail, but that's, you're not a good skill with people, then you need to know that with the medicine. Uh, another is lifestyle value. So how much is it important for you to be home on a regular basis with your 13 year old, how important is it to be married, how important is it to live in a community and go to a church, and then also the money. How much do you, how much is, do you want to make? It's not just how much is enough because I talk to many people who whatever they make is enough and they spend that plus 10 percent. So, uh, and you know, and that could be $500,000 or $100,000 or, or $20,000. So helping people continually move in that sweet spot, I think is one of the things that, that I try to do. And I also want to applaud you folks that, uh, full disclosure, I'm coaching three or four of your your uh, your leaders now. And that's pretty uh, a light and type of thing to do is to invest in coaching and support and education for the people who are moving into leadership positions. Because nobody taught you how to be a leader, they taught you how to be a doctor. And so now you've got a, a different kind of a role. So. Uh, and this group uh, has put a lot of their uh, their resources behind that, and I think that's great. Uh, let's get some feedback, okay? We'll go to the opioids in a minute, but who else has something they wanted to, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll go back. And you're, come on up here just a minute, too, because I want to have you talk about the red barrels. But what is the feedback you want to give, uh, first yeah, of all? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a nice yeah. Joe, this is Joe uh, Carney from uh, Livingston County. Come on over here, Joe, where they can see you. But Joe, what is the feedback you want to give, and then we can all introduce you. A friend of mine who was dealing with. Um, you can turn this way so that you need to be on camera. So uh, his over is looking. I was over. showing my best side. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a friend of mine who's was dealing with her father, trying to remember everything the doctors told her. She started recording the what he was telling them so that she could refer back to her. Now, she never had any problems with doctors that she was dealing with, but I would imagine in this day and age, everybody's worried about saying the wrong thing sometimes. But do you think it would lessen the callbacks to you trying to figure out what's going on if they had actually recorded what you said when, when they're in a very stressful situation? One that doesn't affect you as much as it does them. 
Rob, you want to help? Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> body body you know cameras. I, I've yeah. never thought of that. I mean, we've had people who have taped us surreptitiously, which we don't like. No. Uh, but I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I might even suggest that at the bedside with my patients for now. He's available as a consultant. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, it's like, wow, I didn't even think of that before. I mean, it sounds like you got... Well, um, just a, a quick clarification. So if um, the per Michigan is a one-party consent state um, with respect to recording, and so I can record the conversation, and if Lee is my patient, Lee could record the conversation but as a third party, it's in, unless you got permission of the both of us, as a third party, it actually would be illegal for you to surreptitiously record it. So just make sure that you have the conversation. If you are going to record it, have it with the patient and the doctor. Otherwise, you're running afoul of wiretapping laws, just as a, as a thing. Well, uh, is, this is guy knows all the game is, rules here. <laughs> <laughs> is it a third party if you're talking yes. to her father and her father's recording it. No, if, her, if, if I'm talking to the patient, right? So it's, I have a doctor-patient relationship. Yep. One of the two of us can record it, and that is fine. As a third party, any other family member is considered a third party, and, and that, that runs afoul of wiretapping laws. So, so yeah. you just, you just, it's just, just a clarification. And some doctors do get a little bristly, especially if you're like, and that's especially if you're doing video recording. Um, like we, some people want to record procedures, um, things like that. We may ask you to like, don't include the face. Like there are some things where we might say, hey, you know, if you want to take a picture before and after, that's fine, but maybe not. Like let's record the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think that in addition to maybe recording the conversation that you have with families, one of the things that we employ or we really try to, I know that Rob is a master at this, is the teach back, um, which is the, you know, after the end, after we've said all the things to the family members, say like, hey, what do you, what, what do you, what do you think I just told you? What can you tell me what I just told you? Um, and that, that I think is probably every bit as effective, right? That's and so, but that's the opportunity, right? Yeah. So if, if, if I'm, if I'm talking to Lee and you're his family member and then you say like, hey, okay, so do you, can you just tell me back what I just told you about your family member? And you say, honestly, no. Okay. Then I got to start, you know, we got to, we got to pull back and start at ground zero. So Keenan, I want to, just one of the thing is, uh, I mean, this, I, I want to get you guys talking about drugs and opioids because, <laughs> I want to talk uh, about drugs. <laughs> Show them your shirt. Show them your shirt here. Yeah. This is uh, the Red, Red Barrel, Barrel Program. Project. And uh, can you tell them what the Red Barrel is, and then maybe you could talk about the uh, yeah. problems as we yeah. find it in the ER. Yeah, the, uh, I represent the uh, Red Barrel Project. We're volunteers for the Scott Community Alliance. Several years back, um, two Irish men, me and my friend Terry Murray, got upset that you had to wait 363 days if for the DEA was going to have a drug take back. And you had to have it in your house, where both of us knew people that were had addiction problems. So the best thing to do is get it away quickly. Uh, we started a program in Livingston County, and it's called the Red Barrel Program. It's a no questions asked program that you just take it to your local police department and they have a red barrel there, you put it in there and it's taken care of, it's incinerated. Um, when we first started this program, we were at the State Police Post in Michigan, uh, in Brighton, and the Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Freely, freely admits that he went along with the program, he said he'd take care of all the drugs, because he has people talking to him all the time about they want to do things. He says, I never figured out that they actually do it. So, and he takes care of getting it to the incinerator and everything for the whole county. Uh, other counties do the same thing. We're in 36 counties now. We are in every state police post in the state of Michigan. Um, when we started this program years back, we wanted to figure out when we hit a thousand pounds what we had. And we took all the pills out, no pills, no bottles, no nothing. 
put them in a box and got a volume of pills. We extrapolated that up to a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds of pills is a box four feet by four feet by three and a half feet tall. And we've collected over five tons. Wow. We also, we also um, take all over-the-counter medications because the hardest thing about the program is to get people to realize it's there. So by taking everything, we reach out to the environmental community and they start talking about it. You have Red Barrel programs right here in Lewis, or Washington County. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your effort. I know you've been working with this group to try to get the get out to the uh, St. Joe's Hospital. Yeah. Oh. We, uh, through uh, St. Joe's Hospital, Dr. Um, Curdy. 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 We are trying to get them into hospitals because yeah, there's a couple of people out there that don't like to go into police stations. <laughs> I don't know what. With their narcotics. But, <laughs> with their narcotics. <laughs> but, uh, They've been in there with their narcotics in their body, not, yeah. not outside. So um, we started it in, in uh, Livingston County. We have one at both hospitals in Livingston County. We're trying to expand it. We're talking to Washtenaw and St. Joe's wanted to expand it into their other hospitals. There we came into a rub with uh, the DEA, and we're working on um, solving that problem. And then St. Joe's, hopefully, if we get it solved with the DEA, they will put it in all their hospitals across the Pike County area. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Could you speak then uh, to some of the uh, emergency, how emergency room interacts with some of the drug problems we're having, including opioids? Well, um, we're, we're kind of on the front line with respect to patients that are found down out in the communities. I think um, one of the people when I was speaking to beforehand who wanted to know how we addressed um, the home, homeless population and anything that we did. Well, we're, we are right there for any of the um, indigent people or anybody that is found uh, down. And we're sort of, as I said, with the uh, Poison Control Center, we're sort of at the front line for figuring out, oh, okay, all of a sudden now people who are not just coming in with um, you know opiate overdoses but they're actually dying in the field so maybe something new is being put in there or they're coming in with bone marrow suppression so maybe it's a, a new drug that's being uh, you know contaminating the supply or um, it's being cut with um, but I guess the if you guys haven't read the book Dreamland by Sam Quinones um, it does a great job outlining it's a fascinating read and it's very quick uh, read sort of outlining all the different things that happened uh, at the same time all and it, it's um, sort of centered around uh, Port, uh, Portsmouth, Ohio which is one of the sites that we have um, that we staff through our company um, and uh, the changes that took place um, with respect to trying to take care of cancer pain um, which is a, a, a real thing and needs to be addressed and so when you tap into that this is pain and people are suffering and now there's a new drug called OxyContin that, um, that can help people with that, with um, Purdue Pharma's you know, drive for profits and misinterpreting an article or a, a little you know, sort of two-paragraph thing that was published in uh, letter, to letter to the Editor, yeah, <laughs> in, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine saying, hey, when we were treating patients inpatient with, uh, for, for pain, and only 0.1% got addicted, and that just became dogma. Um, even though it didn't, it wasn't a trial, it wasn't anything, it was just sort of a, hey, this is something that we noticed. Um, and then you combine that with um, the uh, drug cartels and um, sort of a Domino's Pizza style delivery system to small towns um, to provide heroin, um, you know, 30 minutes or less, um, and they would bring these people in um, and cycle them through and, and all of that. So that that is like... I could talk for a whole hour just about that particular problem, but in terms of where we are in the emergency department, um, I think that um, there's been a lot of pressure put on us subsequent to this you know, being brought up as a national problem for us to reduce the number of prescriptions that we have. And I think a lot of um, what I've felt, and I'm not sure if you guys feel this as well, but it's sort of one of those like, hey, if those darn doctors would just stop prescribing opiates, then you know, we'd have this thing licked. But um, that's 100% not the issue um, in its entirety um, because we see like even if we do put somebody on just a couple of days and there's a lot of legislation now about uh, within the state 
about the number of pills that we can prescribe and needing to look at the, there's an automated prescription system that keeps track of all of the prescriptions that are written for patients across the state. And um, we're, we, need to, we need to query that and look at that to find out if a person's jumping around like, well, yesterday you saw Dr. McCurdy and then you know, the day before that you saw Dr. Simmons and Dr. Benjamin, why are you, you, know, why are you here today? All that's recorded there. Um, but the state now sort of mandates if you're going to prescribe over so many pills that you um, query that. So what's our role in it at this point? Well, we try to prescribe um, naloxone, which is the sort of reversal agent. Um, we have kits in our, in, our, in our emergency department that we can give to patients and give to patients' family members uh, who, uh, who have had overdoses. So um, I had one uh, two weeks ago where it was a, a couple and they were together and they both passed out in McDonald's and they had to have EMS called and they were resuscitated and they brought in and I, um, I made sure that they each left with the nasal spray um, with this reversal agent. Um, so we, you know, we, we serve a variety of different purposes, I guess. We're trying to address it by decreasing our prescriptions within reason, um, having conversations with people about why we're not prescribing opiates or some other alternatives um, and uh, surveillance for trends of abuse and then uh, putting in systems in place to be able to, to help people if, they're, if they are around an accidental overdose, that they have the naloxone to save their family member or friend that they happen to be with. I see uh, we're almost out of time. It's, it's about five minutes to nine. You've asked for more feedback. I would like you to... Um, Take out your phones if you have some feedback and uh, just write it in an email. And I'm asking you to do it right now because if you get home and you forget it, so um, rpasic at gmail, R T A S I C K. So while we're wrapping up, if you have some thought that you'd like to send to these folks, uh, I'd be happy to pass it on to them. They're talking about the ACA. Oh, yeah. I, somebody was asking about the ACA and that's one of the things that we really like to, to kind of talk about. I don't think we're going to have enough time to really go into it in depth here, um, but I will, I'll cover a little bit. One of the things I want to say is that all of us are very happy to come and talk anywhere. So if you have a group you'd like us to come and talk with or, or whatever forum, we're happy to do that. We don't charge anything. It's really our benefit because we get to learn from the community what the community needs are, and we get to share uh, you know, our experiences with you. So the ACA, just really briefly, obviously isn't working as well as we would like it to. Um, you know, I've always been a big proponent. I think, you know, regardless of your political track, I think, you know, we're seeing, starting to see some glimmers of hope. But the biggest problem in the elephant room is things are totally misaligned. So what do, what do we uh, pay for? We pay for testing. Uh, we pay for procedures. And that's all on the tail end. The, the stuff that we don't value or pay for is talking to patients and connecting with patients and having a relationship with patients. So you have this system where primary care physicians are on the front line and establishing these relationships that are gonna try and prevent you from having a bypass at some point and getting the complications of diabetes. Get five minutes with their patients, you know, because they have to see so many. They're the lowest paid providers you know, in the United States, while the proceduralists, you know, people who are doing, uh, you know, catheterizations and, you know, some of the other procedures that are way down the line because we failed at primary care are making the big bucks. And I'm not blaming anybody, that's just the way the system was set up. So, you know, you're a medical student, you're like, well, unless you really have a passion for primary care and you're looking at what, I mean, there's a huge difference between you know, a primary care physician may make $150,000 and you've got specialists who are making over a million a year. I mean, that's really, it's not uh, very well aligned. So until we change that system, uh, I don't think we're gonna make any big dent in the amount of money that we spend per capita in our GDP every year for healthcare costs. Now there's some glimmers of hope. So, um, you know, for the first time in my career in 25 years, we're starting to actually see some leveling out of ER visits. Not only that, but we're also seeing uh, the people who have kind of the lower acuity stuff, you know, colds and coughs and some minor injuries. We're not really seeing that population anymore. Part of it is they're going to urgent cares, but also the primary care physicians are making an effort to get them into the offices. So 
that's good. I mean, that's a problem I have to deal with staffing and all that. But you know, <laughs> if it's value added for patients, that's what we want. We spend a lot of our time keeping patients out of the hospital, so things that the hospital still can get paid for, we're actually doing in the ER and sending them home instead. And, but we're not getting paid for that thing, so there's still a misalignment. For the first time in my career, my department's working on lowering the cost of care for people. So you know, we share everybody's uh, imaging utilization, so you know how you prepare with the rest of your group. There's best practices for you know when to use a CT, when to use an MRI. Um, community preparedness. Yeah, and we also, and, you know, I'll let, let Keenan comment on this, we also have a community paramedic program that helps us keep patients out of the hospital too. So these are specially trained paramedics in a special rig. They will go out to a, a house that's called for a 911 visit and if they feel like this is somebody who potentially stay in their home, they contact us. We can, we can actually, through telemedicine, talk and see the patient. We've been able to keep people from even having to come to the hospital in the first place. They've been able to provide interventions and the community paramedics will even come back later that day or the next day and check on the patient and set up a primary care visit for them. So lots of stuff that you know might affect my income but really is the right thing for patients. We're starting to see that the problem is that the, the, the payment isn't aligned for those. So we don't get really paid anything for that, but you know, we're just kind of in the initial stages. So um, like I said, we could talk you know, hours on, on the ACA, but like I said, there's some glimmers of hope there, but there's so much more to do. I wanted to uh, uh, add one more thing and then I'll, I want to do thank yous, but you know, feedback. Uh, would you mind if I put your, uh, I could send folks who attended your emails and if you have a direct question, because you might not want to go through me if you have something. So Absolutely. I will send out Beth, where's Beth in the room? Yeah, so Beth, uh, maybe you and I can try to send them a, a really immediate follow-up uh, with some of the questions that we get, but also you might want to direct them directly to, to one of these folks. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, my wife cut her finger last year and uh, she, she decided exactly what was going to happen, made all the decisions about where we were going to go. And later on we said, you know, that was really stupid because she was in trauma with the cut finger and she wanted to decide, you know, we go to urgent care, do we go to the U of M, do we go to how we're going to drive there. And so we made a pact with each other that if one of us gets hurt or gets sick, we give the other person the uh, power to decide a, whether we have to go to the doctor, B, whether we go to the emergency room. So we take it out of the injured person's hands and put it into the person who's healthier because when you're injured, you're in trauma. And right away you say, I'm fine, you know, I, I don't need anything. So I think this is uh, something I might want to just pass on to folks is maybe if you live with somebody, make a pact and give that other person uh, the power. Now, if that person is a hypochondriac, and they're taking the hospital. <laughs> I might want to talk it over a little bit, but, uh, but I think it's worthwhile. To, the idea is plan ahead and, because we all have emergencies. Anybody not been in an emergency room in the last five years? I mean, it's, it's rare, right? So we, Stay out. <laughs> we don't need the business. Actually, I think your attendance is going to go up because we're also, we want to get your tender love and care here. It's not so good. So I want to thank this, this wonderful group uh, and Lee and Keena, uh, Keenan. Keenan Steph and Rob for giving us their time and I really think following up with them this, this idea of wanting to connect with the community is so great and you know there's two hospitals in this town I think St. Joe's really does do a better job I don't want to be critical of Michigan of reaching out and being part of the community and, and listening and we're really blessed in our community to have these two fine facilities so uh, we'll see you back October 4th we're going to have Tom Serbukin here and Tom is a uh, went from the engineering school to running research for NASA. And he's a brilliant guy. He's been talking about change management. He's trying to change NASA, which is uh, a little bit challenging. So and he's a great leader, so we're going to do that. And then in November, uh, Eric and some of his colleagues who are military leaders, uh, we should get you in that one, Devin. We're going to talk about what leadership has turned into in the military, how people are trained to be leaders. And we have a panel of uh, people who will be coming who are uh, in the military, including uh, your doctor, whose name is uh, Skip. Skip, what's his last name? Skip, Skip Walton. Skip he's Walton. part of your group. Yeah. And Skip, Skip. is uh, going to join us. He just came back from Guantanamo for a lot of the summer. So 
it would be a lot of interesting to hear about that experience. Was All he, right. He was, so he was found not guilty. Then? <laughs> <laughs> As I should clarify, he was found not guilty. Then. <laughs> Because they do trials. They do. <laughs> so, uh, all right. I mean, if, please feel free to linger, uh, hang out, talk to each other. That's the connect part of this program. Have a good ask if you need something. Have a good give if you want to give something. And uh, we can stay in the room for a while and talk. But, again, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.